I read somewhere recently that we ought to practice dying at least once a month. To lie out on your couch or your bed and imagine what it would be like not to be anymore. To uh, think of what you'd like to die from. To think about um, who you would like to have carry you out. Who you'd like to have pray and sing. Uh, how much you'd like for your family to spend on the funeral. And how you would like to be remembered. This afternoon, we have Dr. Gina Gervy Moore, one of my colleagues, a core faculty member from Family Medicine. She's going to talk to us about talking about death. Hopefully, it won't kill you. Thank you for that. Uh, that that kind uh, introduction, Dr. Alexander. And thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Um, although talking about death won't necessarily kill you, perhaps talking about PowerPoint or Apple computers may kill you. So, um, But what we want to talk about today, we're going to go on an adventure. And whenever you go on an adventure, you have to get ready. So here are my two dogs with my husband. They've got their little backpacks on. They're ready to go. Getting ready. This is, uh, this is Zoe on the left and Zach on the right, short for Prozac and Zoloft because they, uh, they make me very happy. There's Zoe. She used to love the van again. She's ready. She doesn't have her seat belt on, but she'll, she'll be ready soon. And there's Zach out on an adventure. He loves to go out on patrol. So what are our goals and objectives? And believe it or not, I talk fast, and I can actually do this in half an hour. But um, we want to recognize the need for palliative care in today's healthcare system. We would like to understand the importance of non-abandonment of our dying patients. And finally, identify the key components to be addressed with a patient living with a life-limiting illness. And these gentlemen who are filming this have told me that I can't move around, which is a really hard thing for me. I should probably put duct tape on my feet because I get the urge to move. But I will try to do this standing fairly still. So I want to start off with a case example. You have an 81-year-old female who presents to the emergency department with syncope. She passes out. She has no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no palpitations. Her past medical history includes hypertension, coronary artery disease. She had a, a heart attack in 1986. And she lives with her elderly spouse. She has several episodes of these attacks of passing out. She'll go out for a walk and pass out on the sidewalk. Or she'll be out shopping and she passes out. She comes in several times and finally they uh, undergo a workup and they find that on her echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, it shows that she has critical aortic stenosis. So your aortic valve is supposed to open up to let out the blood flow and when you have critical aortic stenosis, it means that aortic valve is very, very, it's not opening up and you can barely get any blood flow out. And that's why she passes out. She um, also during workup shows that if they want to replace her valve, her aortic valve, she also has significant three-vessel coronary artery disease. So if she's going to get the valve, she also needs a three-vessel bypass. And this is a pretty high-risk surgery. Uh, remember, we're talking about an 81-year-old. So let's say you are the physician. Um, or if uh, that's uncomfortable to you, let's say you're the patient or the family. How do, you, how do you make decisions? Um, what kind of information do you want to know to help um, decide should she go through with this surgery or not? So what are the issues involved? Just throw out some things that you would want to know, whether you're the doctor, the patient, the family. What are things that might be important? Anybody? The possibility that the, the procedure would kill her. OK, what's the possibility the procedure might actually end in death? OK, good question. What else? Okay, how long is recovery? How long will she get back to baseline if she does get back to baseline? Um, what, what will rehab be like? Um, what is her baseline is a good question. What other things do you think of? How much improvement in function will she gain from this? Okay, other things? Okay, payments, always a, a question. Um, insurance, what kind of coverage does she have? Um, how about who's going to take care of her later? What's the health of her elderly spouse if he's going to be taking care of her? Um, other questions? What's our sense of what she wants? What does she want? Okay. What does she want? What does her family want? Is there, um, is there discord there? Um, 
She actually is a relatively healthy 81-year-old. She has some mild memory problems, some early dementia, but really um, um, functions relatively well. The problem is that when she goes out and she has these fainting episodes, her husband says, you know, I, I can't continue, go on like this. She can't keep having these episodes. I just don't know what to do. And so um, then you look at family. She has um, four daughters. Two are rather close and two are, are not so close. And um, one has a background in health care, and, and that one is the youngest, and she's very concerned about, boy, is there a possibility that she's going to have a stroke and end up even more debilitated than she is? Um, is the possibility, what, what is the likelihood of death? Um, is that um, even worse than the likelihood that she will end up in a, in a nursing home long term? So all these kinds of questions. Any other questions that you would want to know? Okay, let's go on. So obviously these are important issues when you're talking about any kind of medical decision. It's always a matter of weighing the benefits versus the burdens. So what does the patient want? What does the family want? And, um, you know, in the best case scenario, surgery goes well, she breezes through, no complications, she gets back to the point where she's able to do her daily activities, walk around without having these fainting episodes. Worst case scenario, and um, some people might um, debate what is the worst case scenario. Some might say death is the worst case scenario. Others might say, well, um, there may be a fate even worse than death. Uh, if this is someone who has been independent and has um, wanted to, to be able to do things on her own and if she ended up bed bound from a, a stroke or other major cardiac event, then that might be um, significant. So what happened? Well, she checks into the hospital in April of 1998 and at the time it's, you know, the ungodly hour of like 6 a.m. She's alert though, she's smiling, she's laughing with her family. She undergoes surgery, and the family's in the waiting room all day. It's a, it's a lengthy procedure, and she actually has some complications. She has a problem. She gets a platelet infusion and has an adverse reaction to that, becomes hypotensive. She develops some arrhythmias. They almost actually, at the end of the surgery, have to go back in and uh, open her up and um, do uh, uh, open cardiac massage. So um, significant events. But before we actually go on to talk about um, what happened to my mom, because this is actually my mom I'm talking about, we have to go back. This is me as a baby. So we have to back up a bit before I go on to, to tell you the rest of the story. Now, my story is, is maybe a little unique. Um, I think everybody here has either family, friends, somebody they know who have gone through um, difficult um, medical episodes. Uh, my particular story involves um, being adopted, actually, by elderly parents. My father was 65 years old when he got me as a baby. I was four days old. So um, I don't know what kind of neurosis or psychosis he had going on, but uh, what possessed him to do that at that age, but he did that. And my mom wasn't that much younger than him. Um, she was 54. And I was the youngest of four girls who were adopted. And here's my mom with me uh, shortly after I came home. And here she is at 54. And she looks pretty good, I think, a pretty good, um, young-looking 54-year-old. And when I was younger, I used to think, wow, 50 was kind of old. But now that as I, as I get older, I think 50 is really very young. Um, but you know, as I see patients, it's amazing. I can have very, very young-looking 80-year-olds and 50-year-olds who look like they're going on 90. So really, chronological age is, is all relative. And I'm sure uh, Will Alexander would attest to that. So as I grew up, I was very much aware, obviously, of my parents' advanced age. As, as we'd go to school functions, that type of thing, I would be asked, you know, oh, are these your grandparents? And no, I'd have to say these are my parents. And actually, in, um, in high school, uh, in, in academy, my sophomore year, my mom had a heart attack, uh, which was a very frightening event for me. She ended up in the intensive care unit. And it made me very frightened, and I was very worried. Obviously, as a teenager, you're kind of egocentric, and the concern is, was certainly for my mom, but more concern for me. Who's going to take care of me? What's going to happen to me if something happens to my parents? So um, even though those fears were kind of in the back of my mind, I, I was lucky enough to reach um, milestones. I made it through high school. I finished college, and my parents were still with me. 
in medical school. Um, I started in August of 92 and got married in um, the summer of 1994. And here's my father. This is him when he's 89 years old and uh, uh, at my wedding. And I don't know who's holding who up, but uh, we, we managed down the aisle. And uh, this, you know, this suit, he was always very proud that he married actually all four of his daughters in this suit. And, and uh, th there's quite an age difference between us. So this is a very old suit. But he got a new tie for each wedding. So, but, um, so you know, a pretty young 89-year-old. Um, and he really had no, um, nothing that we would consider a classic terminal illness. He had a, a gradual slow decline. He had um, breathing problems, some emphysema, although he had never smoked in his whole life. He had some congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, developed diabetes late onset. Um, and he really just had kind of generalized weakness. He would get short of breath with walking, um, get some swelling in his, in his ankles. And here is uh, my graduation from medical school. And you will see that my dad is missing from this picture because he was too ill at this time to come down. This was in uh, May of 96. And you see my mom there, my husband Lance, uh, my sister Lisa and her husband David, and my niece. Um, and he was very sad that he missed this event. Um, he was very proud of the fact that I had, I had uh, uh, made it through um, medical school and uh, he adored my husband the way my husband um, basically conned him into um, letting him marry me was my sister had bought a new house and they needed to do landscaping. So my husband brought his Kubota tractor from Tillamook, Oregon all the way to Walla Walla, Washington on the back of his truck so we could do some landscaping for my sister. So that pretty much impressed my dad. If we look at what is the cause of death in most Americans, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I want to die in my sleep, I want to die of a massive heart attack, I want to be in an accident and, and not wake up. Really, less than 10% of us will this happen to. It is really a, a pretty rare thing. So you're, you're going across campus street and Mark Carr is late for an appointment and you're in the sidewalk and boom, he hits you and it's over. That is just a very infrequent thing. We, we don't see this very much. The more frequent um, thing that we, we see, picture of death, is, is what we typically call the, um, the cancer uh, trajectory. And cancer is something that has been well studied. We know the different stages of cancer. We've had large populations to say, OK, if we have this many people at this stage, we kind of know how long they have to live. And so we have this rather steady decline over time um, and eventual death. And it's relatively, um, within certain parameters, well, relatively easy to say, OK, you're probably going to die within the next two, three months. But what is by far the most common way that Americans die today is, is this picture. So what are Americans dying of? They're dying of chronic diseases, such as congestive heart failure, such as um, uh, emphysema, uh, complications from diabetes. So we see this gradual, slow decline over time. But each downward um, spike is a particular crisis. So let's say you're going along and flu season hits and you get a pneumonia, you end up in the intensive care unit, but our docs are so good that they get you better, and so you climb back up, you get back home, and you slowly decline over time. And then you, are, um, you get some, some um, stressful news about family, and you end up having a, a heart attack. You end up back in the intensive care unit. But again, medicine has come so far, and we can do so much for people that you get better and you end up going back home. So it is this, this gradual slow decline over time punctuated by these crises. And you never know which one of these crises is going to finally um, cause your eventual death. And with that in mind, it's very hard to, um, to give our patients advice and talk about advanced directives. And how do you talk to somebody about, you know, you've had emphysema, you've been on the ventilator twice, um, do you want to go back on it again? Or is it now time to think about maybe just keeping you comfortable the next time you come in? So it's very hard for physicians to give patients good advice and um, direct them on, on what the next step should be. So what happened with my mom? Well, um, her surgery was actually in 98, the, the weekend um, of my 10th high school reunion. 
Um, she ended up in intensive care unit for about uh, a week and a half, almost two weeks, I think, because of the complications. And I think one of the hardest things for me and my family to see was we had left her that morning um, doing relatively well, walking, talking, smiling. And the next thing, we see her in her uh, intensive care room. She is, is um, um, severely swollen from all the fluids they've had to give her. Even her, her eyes are swollen so that her eyelids won't even close all the way. Um, and she obviously has a ventilator, a tube in, um, lots of lines coming out, as you typically see in an intensive care unit. And um, although I kind of knew what to expect, I think it was much more difficult for those family members who really weren't as familiar with what happens in an intensive care unit. But with uh, gradually over time, um, she improved and she was moved out to the regular med surge floor where she spent about another week, uh, a week and a half or so. And then she ended up having to go to a, uh, a rehab facility, a nursing home basically, for more rehab. And, um, you know, as rehab places go, it was, it was okay, um, but it is, it is not probably the place I would want to leave somebody who I love and care about. Um, and despite the, the best efforts to make nursing facilities as, um, as home-like and as warm and comforting and comfortable as possible, they just, they leave something to be desired. She was there for a couple months almost, um, and she never really quite was the same afterwards. I told you that from the very beginning, her baseline, she had some memory problems, and those got much worse. Um, her personality changed a little bit, actually for the better. She had been kind of ornery and stubborn, and she was a little bit more mellow afterwards, so um, that, was, that was a blessing, but she was never quite, quite the same. After she completed rehab, uh, my parents went back to live uh, in Walla Walla, and um, they both really, their, their health continued to decline over time. And eventually, they had to move in with my older sister in September of 1998. Um, and at this time, my sister was living in Seattle, and they had bought a house, and the downstairs was, uh, was an unfinished basement. So with direction from my father about all the things he wanted and didn't want, they redid the basement, put in a bathroom, a kitchenette, everything that they wanted. And they did well there for a while. Um, this is, uh, that was in September of 98. This is d Christmas of 1998. This is a, a family picture that we decided to get. We said, you know what, um, our parents might not be here very long. So we have my, my dad in the middle, my mom to the side, um, four, four, four daughters and uh, some grandkids there. Uh, as they, um, as, as uh, winter came, went along, my mom required um, some hospitalizations for chest pain, for other complications, and they began to require more and more um, care that my sister wasn't able to give. She was working as well as taking care of, of um, a, a young toddler, and so eventually in April of 1999, the next spring, they moved into an assisted living place. And this was a really nice place. Uh, this was a place that, um, boy, if I had qualified, I'd move into. They had, this, uh, they had this little recreation room that had a popcorn maker that always had popcorn there and an ice cream machine and, you know, unlimited. So I, I, I enjoyed that. But, um, you know, this was hard for my parents because despite the fact that they needed more care, they, they hated the fact that they were losing their independence. They had to scale down their belongings. You know, they were going into um, actually a fairly large um, uh, room or, or, or suite that actually had two rooms. Most of these places often just have one room. But this really bothered them, and, and it, was, it was costly, and a lot of folks aren't able to afford that. Fortunately, my parents had saved, and they were able to afford this. My mom continued to get worse and um, was again hospitalized uh, for chest pain. Her, um, she got worse as she was in the hospital and we had all talked about the fact that if she were to, um, if she were to code, if she were to stop breathing, her heart stop, we did not want uh, resuscitation attempts. We had tried to talk to her about this and, and she kind of basically went along with whatever we said. Um, but, but she was never the type of person who wanted to talk about death and dying. It just wasn't something that polite people talked about. And so, you know, when we talked about things like, you know, make sure that you have your will done and advanced directives, she never wanted to, to really um, uh, get involved with that. 
she, um, she was in the hospital um, doing fairly well. Um, and actually, my three sisters were there at the time. I had just gone up and, and seen her um, and then had come back down uh, to finish my residency. My residency was fin finishing up in June of 99. And she was hospitalized, and one night she had a um, severe episode of, of crushing chest pain. Uh, so I believe she had a, a, a massive MI, and she died there in the hospital. And it's interesting from, my, from a spiritual perspective. My sisters, um, one was um, the, the oldest uh, adopted sister was one who had um, believed in kind of the Eastern philosophy, believed in um, um, uh, um, crystals and things like that. So you have one sister here in the hospital room as my mom is sick. I'm trying to find out which way is east to find out which way to, to pray to Mecca. My other sister um, who lives in Hawaii was kind of a um, more of a uh, evangelical Christian um, who liked to, you know, get down on their knees and pray. Uh, my other sister um, was probably more like me and, and sedate and not as, uh, uh, as uh, outgoing in our show of, of uh, faith, but she was sitting by my mom's bedside. So here within this one room, within this one family, you have vastly different uh, outlooks on spirituality. But I was happy that my mom um, uh, was not alone. Um, I, was, I was sad that I hadn't been there, but I had seen her before and had said my goodbyes. This was at her funeral, and um, my older sisters, who hadn't been as involved uh, in seeing her over the last few years, um, there was a big debate over what kind of coffin to get. And those who typically have um, lots of guilt and remorse tend to want to spend at the upper end. Um, those of us who felt like, you know, Mom really didn't care that much about this, didn't feel the need to spend as much. But it, a, a lovely, uh, lovely coffin um, that she finally got. Um, and here is her, her gravestone. And talking about costs, my mom had been born in Hawaii, and she wanted to go back there to be buried. She, this has been planned. She had a family plot there. And the expense of sending um, a body back by plane uh, overseas um, uh, to the islands was, was, was very expensive. Then what happened to my dad? Well, my dad was, was now on his own. And he had always felt like since he was older than my mom that he was kind of planning on dying before her. Um, but now she was gone. All his daughters were married off, which was um, kind of his way of knowing that they would be taken care of. And his health actually started to deteriorate. Um, he finally um, moved actually from Seattle to Hawaii to be with my other sister. And uh, there he developed uh, dysphagia. He had difficulty swallowing. He kept getting episodes of aspiration pneumonia. And interestingly enough, the physicians there told him that he needed to get a peg tube um, so that he could be fed so that he wouldn't aspirate. But those of you who know anything about artificial feeding and peg tubes, peg tubes don't prevent aspiration. Certainly you don't have the risk of choking if you're putting something in your mouth. But even with a, a peg feeding, you can aspirate. It can come up and go into your lungs. Uh, well, he didn't want any of this anyway, so he chose to go home on hospice, and he was home about a week and a half before he died in September of 99. So uh, about four months later, he died. Uh, here we are, my sisters, uh, at uh, his, his funeral, actually. He was very different from my mom. He hadn't really planned a, um, they hadn't b planned to be married to, uh, buried together. Uh, he had really said, you know, just cremate me, and on your way out the building, just throw my ashes in the, in the uh, ashtray container there. Well, we didn't want to do that, so uh, we, we had an informal service for him at the beach. Uh, he had enjoyed going to the beach, so we thought he'd like that. And we, uh, we actually threw some rose petals out. Uh, this was at sunset um, into the water uh, to commemorate him. So here they are. This was the Christmas of 98, the last Christmas before they died. Um, and, you know, thinking back, I, I think um, with the patients I have seen now in, in my rather short um, experience, um, my parents did, I think, remarkably well. I mean, they stayed relatively healthy and young up until really the very end. Um, unfortunately, not all our patients um, are that fortunate. And, uh, you know, we all have stories, and I'm sure you all have your own story. 
Um, and it's important that you reflect upon that, and if we had time, we could have all of you that wish to share tell us our story, but think about that. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about how things have changed. You know, if you look at medical care 100 years ago, there were a lot of things we didn't have. We didn't have antibiotics. We didn't have big university hospitals with intensive care units and ventilators and dialysis machines. And really, people died um, relatively quickly. If you got an infection, you were maybe sick for a week, two weeks, and there was nothing we could do, uh, no antibiotic to give you, and you died from that infection. Or you died from accidents, from, let's say, industrial accidents, mining accidents, accidents out on the farm. Um, and um, we didn't have ambulances to come and whisk you away to an emergency department that was fully equipped to keep you going. So medicine's focus was really on comfort. Um, I think of the, the doctor from Little House on the Prairie who had his little black bag, and that was all the, the, the medical technology he had. But he would go out, actually, in his little buggy to these farmhouses, and he, what would he then do? He would actually stay there. If, if grandma was dying at home, even though there wasn't much he could do for her um, in medical terms, he would stay there, and his presence and his company and his caring would help the family get through that. While this has changed, uh, medicine really focuses much more on technology. We focus on cures and fixes. Um, I haven't met anybody who comes to medical school saying, my goal is to help people die better. Most people say, I want to heal people, I want to fix um, people, I want to help them get better. And if you look at how medical school is taught, medical school is, is taught to, if somebody presents with, say, a cough, well, you don't just give them some cough medicine and, and say, okay, hope you feel better. You try to find out what the cough is from. Is it a bronchitis? Is it pneumonia? Is it heart failure? Is it a lung cancer? And you diagnose them and then you treat them. And your goal in treatment is to fix them or cure them. Unfortunately, there are really few cures in medicine. Now, we don't like to admit that, um, but this is indeed the case. You know, if you come in with a, an inflamed appendix, uh, you come in, you get surgery, your appendix is taken out, you're cured. But really, back to what we looked at on the health curve, what are most Americans dying from? They're dying from chronic illnesses, such as congestive heart failure, emphysema, diabetes, high blood pressure. And we don't think of these as terminal illnesses, and therefore we often don't think that the eventual outcome is going to be their death. The biggest advances in healthcare um, are probably the ones that don't get mentioned a lot. Things that really help people live longer were immunizations, cleaning up our water supply and our food supply, making sure that we're not drinking water from where we have our sewers. That made tremendous advances. But those things don't really make big headlines. Things that make headlines are, you know, young Marine gets a second chance at life because he gets a liver transplant or baby gets a baboon heart. Um, so it's these really cures or fixes for a small segment of the population that have lots of, of media attention that really get, get our attention. We have come to see that death is, death is not an expected part of life, but death is actually the enemy. Death is a medical failure. You know, when I talk to my residents, um, a good call night is well, no one died when I was on call, so it was a good call night. You know, rather than thinking, boy, you know, some people are going to die, and we actually expect that. Instead, we see it as a medical failure. And we have, we have gotten to the point where we really fight death at almost all costs, including, and I think sometimes the public at large doesn't see this, but including to the point where we have to exclude comfort. Because sometimes in keeping people alive, it means that we can't offer them things that may relieve their pain or their shortness of breath, but might drop their blood pressure. And there are organizational promises that, you know, we basically feed into society's uh, expectations. So you go down to the 10 freeway and you see big billboards that talk about Loma Linda being the, one of the top ranked hospitals in cardiac care. You don't see billboards that say Loma Linda University Medical Center, a great place to die. Okay, I've tried to get our, our public relations people to do that. They won't go for it. They don't think that's a good, a good choice. So what we've seen really is a change in how medicine has been practiced. If you look, um, from the presentation of the disease, the yellow area 
um, represents curative therapies, so doing surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. And that is actually how, I need to back up, oops, there we go. And that is how medicine was treated up until the 50s or 60s. And we said, boy, you know, um, we did everything to treat you, and then shucks, that last day came along and we lost you. Well, then in about the 60s, 70s, hospice came along and migrated over from England, um, went up into Canada, kind of was slow to come to America. And then we actually had this, this system for taking care of our dying loved ones. But what happened was there was this abrupt, um, this abrupt change between cure, which is in yellow, and comfort, which is in red. And so when you have been um, being treated by your oncologist for a cancer, you've had surgery and radiation, and none of that is now um, uh, available or effective, then when you see your doctor at 1 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, he says, you know, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do for you. Here's a card for hospice. Why don't you go talk to them? And there's this very big sense of abandonment in patients. I mean, if you've been seeing this physician for the last few years, um, uh, fighting this battle with cancer, who else do you want to see you through to the very end than the person who has been with you the most? So what palliative care says is, look, why can't from the very beginning we introduce a little bit of palliative care? And that can be in just the way we actually give people the bad news, give people their diagnosis. And certainly the focus is on curative therapy, but as that gets less and less effective, less and less um, uh, uh, patients are either not able to tolerate it or it's just not working, we focus on increasing the amount of palliative care we give these people until we get to the point where there's a smooth transition to hospice, if that's what the patient desires. Uh, the elephant in the room, uh, which is something we, we talk about, death and dying is just something that people try to avoid. And I've, I've dealt with a lot of patients and their families who the patient knows they're dying, the family knows they're dying, but neither will talk about it because they think they're protecting the other. And so we talk about this big elephant in the room that is this glooming thing, but no one will talk about it. They try to pretend it's not there. And what I found is it really creates more anxiety. Once we, we get them to talk together about what they're afraid of, um, that they're worried that their loved ones uh, aren't going to be... Um, um, aren't going to be well taken care of after they die. They worry about their kids. They worry about their spouses that they're leaving behind. Um, often, once they're able to talk about this, these issues get resolved, and really an opportunity for healing exists when people are able to, to talk about these things. Palliative care, in my, um, uh, in my estimation, is just good medicine. There's nothing magical or special about it. Obviously, it applies to those with advanced life-limiting illnesses, so, you know, if you come in for a strep throat, I'm probably not going to really get into your psychosocial, spiritual issues, um, unless that may be what really brings you there. But certainly patients who have advanced disease, who um, they know that the end is going to come eventually, uh, often it's not their physical pain that's causing them the most trouble, but their spiritual pain, their emotional pain. And we need to be able to reach out to them. We, we have to think outside the box um, because the way we practice medicine today, it just simply is not meeting the needs of our, of our seriously ill patients. So look at that, amazing. I'm on time. Um, I leave you with this thought from Sir William Osler, and he says really the goal of medicine is this, to cure sometimes, to heal often, and to comfort always. And I'm happy to take some questions if we have maybe a minute or two. questions. Overall, from the beginning case that you discussed, which we learned later was about your mother, the number of years between that presentation and her death? Uh, so the question was the presentation from, from uh, my, the beginning story of my mom. It was really about, um, about a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So really relatively short period of time. Other questions? Yes. You've been at this a while, uh, Dr. Moore. Do you see us, are, are we making progress or are things staying about the same? Because I could imagine you giving this talk 10 years ago um, and, and I first encountered Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1973, something, you know, 30 some years have passed. 
Uh, I wonder if we're getting any better. Great question, Dr. Winslow asks, have we made progress? I think slowly we have. Um, I think really the only way that we are going to change this, we have to really change the whole culture. The, um, the, we have to have a paradigm shift in hospital care um, because obviously that's where most Americans are taken care of. This is now, you know, when I went through medical school, end of life care was not taught. Um, even through my residency, what little I got through ethics from Bob Orr, um, that's where I really started picking this up. Um, but before that, end-of-life care was not taught. It's now a requirement in medical school, although still um, it is it is very a small piece. 100% of all medical students will have to deliver a baby by the time they're done with medical school, but not necessarily take care of or know how to take care of a dying patient. So we're making slow progress. Yes. Uh, three or four years ago, we had a conference which involved some of this, uh, Dr. Moore. And I remember at that time the question of here at our medical center, uh, a palliative care suite or suites. Uh, any progress in that regard? Uh, another wonderful question. Um, the, the talk of actually getting palliative care suites, um, it has been it has been slow and laborious, but we are actually hoping to get two rooms on 9200, which is the oncology floor two rooms over at the East Campus, and eventually my goal would be to have a palliative care unit. Um, and we are trying to convince administrators based on a lot of data and research that is out there, plus a, a recent Wall Street Journal article that talked about how the University of Virginia Commonwealth, their palliative care unit actually helped decrease length of stay, decrease costs, and improve patient and family satisfaction. So it's been slow, but we're slowly making progress. You've just met the youngest pioneer that I know and the greatest shifter of paradigms that I know presently. I want to read this to you in closing. This is at the center of what it means to be sick as a Christian, to suffer as a Christian, or to be present as a Christian to those who are sick or suffering. It is to know that life is a matter of being with. It is to know that we belong in sickness and in health in flourishing and in suffering to God and to one another. It is to know that our stewardship of each other's lives makes every one of us debtors to every other one, because in every aspect of our lives and then in our deaths, we belong to God and to one another. It means that we must take time and make room, understanding that being sick, and especially being with those who are sick and suffering and dying, does not take time away from us. Rather, these are the things of life itself. Thank you for coming.